Dr. Glass here has given us a very useful way to understand how the brain works as a control system to help us navigate through life. The chart he has developed is a graphical metaphor that, when understood, can provide many insights into the age-old question of why do we do what we do. Metaphors like the chart are useful tools to communicate something about reality by referring to something that is like the reality but only a representation and not the reality itself. So just as a map is not the territory it represents, Glasser's chart is not the brain. But we can use a map and find it helpful to guide us to our destination or to discover where we are. In the same way, the chart is useful to show some ways that the brain works as a control system to help us get our needs met and move through life with a measure of happiness and success. When I speak of a control system to help us get what we want, I'd like to suggest a common household thermostat as a simple analogy for what is going on in our brain. We set the thermostat to a desired temperature. The thermostat can then monitor the actual temperature in the room. If the actual temperature is below what we have set, the furnace turns on to heat up the room until the actual temperature matches the, what we have set. If the temperature is above what we have set, the thermostat kicks in the, the air conditioner bringing the temperature down to the set temperature. I'm going to be describing some of the details of this process in the rest of this presentation. Historically, the Oracle of Delphi admonished the pilgrim seeking wisdom to know thyself. This sage advice is still relevant in today's complex and challenging world. So let's take a walk around the chart to gain some insight into the process of knowing ourselves a bit better. We can start on this end with the basic needs as Dr. Glasser has listed them. They are belonging, often referred to as love and belonging. There's power, freedom, fun, and survival. You'll note that there are four needs associated with the new brain and only one, the survival need, associated with the old brain. The reason for this very simply is that the four needs listed with the new brain are satisfied with behaviors over which we have some control through the choices we make. Besides the choices we make for our survival, our so-called old brain carries on many involuntary, even unconscious survival processes such as breathing, keeping our heart beating, maintaining our bodily temperature, along with many other functions. You'll notice how the brain, along with the list of basic needs, is connected to the quality world. That is to show that we have some way of recognizing what will meet our needs. We carry an inner image of some sort that symbolically represents those things that we believe will meet our needs. Those quality world pictures, as Dr. Glasser calls them, reside in the part of the brain that we will call the quality world. Now let's move to the other end of the chart and look at the interface between the real world and the inner world of our perceptions. Following the thermostat analogy, the quality world pictures are like the settings on the thermostat. These pictures in our quality world are what we want to meet our needs. Our contact with the real world is like the thermostat testing the temperature in the world outside itself to see what is actually happening. This next part is very important. Understanding how we adapt to what is happening in the real world compared with what we want based on our needs is at the very heart of understanding the brain as a control system for our behavior. Our senses gather data from the real world. We touch the outside world through sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell. This sensory data is then passed through the total knowledge filter where we identify and classify the information our senses are giving us. This is the place where we store what we have learned throughout our life. For example, as a child, we first learned about birds. Then we learned the difference between a robin and a crow. Then we learned other things about birds and many other things. So our total knowledge filter is where that learning is stored. We compare what we are presently sensing with what we have learned in the past about what is happening. Then with the help of the values filter, we do a quick determination of how we are going to respond. The values filter is the place where we compare what we are getting, the actual temperature if we are following our thermostat analogy, with our needs and what we want from the present situation, which is our setting on the thermostat. Based on this evaluation, the information goes into our perceived world where we have a choice on what to do with this perception. It could be totally neutral and just part of the background of our experience. 
This requires no response other than an awareness of where we are and what we're doing. Or these sensations could be recognized as a positive experience, letting us choose to enjoy the moment. Or it is recognized as a threat or an otherwise unpleasant experience, which may require a behavioral response. The important thing to understand about this process is the present experience comes into the perceived world and is quickly compared with past experiences. Our past experience is then linked with the present experience to construct and build what we call a perception. This perception is shaped and colored by what we have learned and experienced in our past. It's also shaped by our beliefs. What do we believe about this particular situation, as well as the actual experience itself? So notice that I use the word constructed. We build our perceptions within our brain, and those perceptions then drive our behavioral choices. Because these perceptions are constructed within our brain, each of our perceptions is unique and may well be different than the constructed perception of another person standing right next to you, experiencing the very same thing. What does this tell you about the need to dialogue to understand one another? So this perception, once constructed, may require a response or it may just need to be filed away as a constructed memory. In other words, we don't just record what we are experiencing as raw information. That raw information is shaped and colored and linked with previous experience along with what we have learned and the way we view our experience through our belief system. So this perception constructed within our brain is what we know of the real world and is more real to us than the real world. This process is very interesting and very important in shaping our understanding of why we do what we do. Next, we go to the comparing place. That's right here on the chart. If our thermostat registers a difference between what we want and what we are getting, a frustration signal is sent to our store of behaviors that prompts us to choose a behavior to try to bring things back into line with what we want. This is where we have stored all that we have learned about what to do in any experience situation. The good part, according to Dr. Glasser, is if we encounter a situation that we have not experienced before and that has no learned behavior associated with it, our creative faculties will come up with something to try. How many times have we heard the expression when dealing with an unknown? I'll think of something. That is our creativity at work. Let's use an example. Let's say we made a date with a friend for lunch. We have agreed to meet at a local restaurant at 12 noon. You arrive and are seated. You wait. You glance at your watch and see that it is 1230. You had agreed on 12 o'clock. At this point, what you want and what you are getting are disconnected. Can you guess what happens next? The frustration generates an impulse to do something. You quickly, and usually unconsciously, do a quick inventory of what you can do. The car, representing total behavior, gives us an idea of what you're experiencing. You're aware of your physiology sending anxiety signals to your awareness. You hope your friend has not been in an accident. Your emotions swing back and forth between indignation and concern. Your thoughts race around the possibility that something bad has happened, or maybe he just forgot, which makes you mad. Finally, you choose to do something rather than just fret. You pick up your phone and you call. This action gives you the information that you need to clarify your thinking, resolve your emotions, and soothe your anxiety. As we look at what goes on in this scene, we can see clearly that the control is not in the emotions or the physiology. The control is in the choice to act, which in turn reshapes our thinking, which can then have an effect on our emotional state and our physiology. Making the choice to call your friend provided needed information which enabled you to focus your thinking on the facts of the situation. This, in turn, relieved you of the impulse to fret over imagined calamities which were upsetting to your physiology. Now here's the really good part. The chart helps us realize that we live in more than one world. There is the real world outside of ourselves that exists regardless of our experience of that world. And then there is our perceived world that contains the representations we construct of the real world, of ourself, and others. These constructed representations are what is commonly called perceptions. And then there is another level that is not illustrated by the chart, and that is the part of you that can look at this metaphor 
and understand that it represents in some way what is going on in your brain and in your experience. Only when these perceptions and constructed representations are exposed to our awareness for what they are can we understand them and change them if needed. We know that the brain is much more complex than this simple illustration. You can find a lot more on the chart and the processes described in the chart in much of what Dr. Glasser has written. I encourage you to read Choice Theory as a way to flesh out this brief presentation. I'd also recommend you do some study on the many insights that advances in neuroscience are bringing to us. Actually, I suspect that most of you are already doing that. So thanks for spending this time with me, and uh, I hope this has deepened your understanding of a, a little, little way of, of what it is that uh, makes us tick. Mm -hmm.